I've clicked on the Global Tropical Overview for August the 1st, 2023. As is always the case in these videos, the thoughts expressed here are mine alone and will make decisions ahead of any tropical cyclones, especially ahead of Typhoon Kanun. Look towards your local weather office, local emergency management, and local tropical cyclone warning center. So across the tropics today, we have uh, lots of systems active across the world, but primarily we're going to be talking about Typhoon Kanun here, as it is very close to the Japanese islands here. Uh, and we may be getting close to what may be a landfall today, local time, of a powerful typhoon. Now, the morning visible satellite imagery is pretty impressive. You can see the eye there. It's not completely clear. The system has been struggling a bit uh, overnight. Uh, but overall, the storm remains a powerful storm. Estimates right now are ranging between high-end Category 3 and low-end Category 4. So the Joint Typhoon Warning Center actually has this about uh, a Category 4 still right now with about 120 knot winds associated with it. It's a very powerful storm, and now it will continue to likely weaken gradually as it comes towards the islands, as there are some signs that there might be an eyewall replacement cycle, and there is also some increased shear that is impinging upon the storm. Now, Let's look at the water vapor loop, uh, and I'll come back to this as we look at more uh, some of the factors that may weaken the storm as it comes towards the islands. But you can see there is still expansive outflow on the eastern side, expanding down south, and with this upper level low, there is still some outflow being expanded on the western side of the storm. But notice this big plume of northerly winds over mainland Japan. That is from a frontal boundary that's coming down over the main part of Japan. And it is bringing some northerly flow here on north of storm. And you can see some thunderstorms that are trying to blow up outside of the storm. You can see their tops get sheared off towards the south, showing some of that northerly shear. And this might be putting some pressure onto the storm. And we've seen some signs that the northern side has been struggling a little bit today. You can see in the microwave pass we got earlier this afternoon or earlier this morning local time, you can see that the northern side was pretty weak. In fact, for times on radar, this has been open to a degree. Now, and I'll have to get my recording software to capture it, but I do have radar to show uh, on the storm, uh, and uh, I can probably, there we go, I need to reposition the scale of it. I'm doing this on the fly, so apologies for this taking a bit of time, but you'll be able to see the well-defined eye structure here on the radar loop, and we have the inner eye wall here. Now, notice how the northwestern side does look a bit weak. It has fluctuated a bit on radar. We've seen at times, again, that this has been breaking at times, and at some points it's been more solid. Now we're seeing maybe some signs that that might be thinning out, but what we also see is we see some stronger thunderstorms on the outer fringe of this inner core. And for that, I'm going to quickly show you this microwave pass again. Note where the outer bands are on this microwave pass. We have the inner core here, and we have some outer bands, one here streaming south of the eye, and one here on the outer fringe of the inner eye wall on the southeastern side. Now, if we look at radar again, I need to get that on the recording software, you can see we have maybe some signs of this band on the southern side of the eye, but primarily we can see some higher radar echoes here on the outer fringe of the eye wall, potentially more so on the northern side here, more so than that microwave pass had shown. What this indicates is that um, we might be going closer to an eye wall replacement cycle. It's, it is difficult to predict these, but the signs are that we might be getting this. And a reminder of what that means, an eye wall replacement cycle means that the system will, for a time, weaken as the ring of thunderstorms around the outer core will surround it and if it will choke it off if you will and eventually that outer eye wall will contract and become the new eye wall these cycles take roughly about half a day to a day to complete more in most cases they take a day in some cases you can get quicker ones 
uh, but those are more rare. Now, the factor of it weakening is good. The unfortunate thing of these eyewall replacement cycles, though, is the system enlarges in size. The rain shield, the wind field will grow with an eyewall replacement cycle. So while it seems like good news at first, it's actually not so good news when you get an eyewall replacement cycle, mainly because you can get increased rainfall over a more expansive area as the winds of typhoon force and tropical storm force are over a more expansive region, and you can get greater storm surge, especially if this system comes, if the eye that is, right upon an island area or a landmass. And unfortunately, that is what's happening here. We are looking at an eyewall replacement cycle starting, potentially, as the system tracks right close to some vulnerable islands south of Japan. Now, uh, we'll have to, of course, keep watch on radar and any future microwave passes to see how this eyewall replacement cycle trends. Now, in some cases, in eyewall replacement cycles, you can get storms to re-intensify, and that may be possible with this storm. However, there might be some factors that keep it at bay from intensifying further after the islands. Now, first of all, the islands may or may not get a landfall. That is still a little bit uncertain. It's a little uncertain on if the storm's going to pass just south or just north. But let me make something very clear that this is a large system. This is a very large storm. Uh, the pressure is at 935 millibars. Uh, that is a very, very low pressure to have at 130 miles per hour, 115 knots. Uh, I believe it's 120 knots on the latest estimate, but at the time of this microwave pass, it was 115 knots. That indicates a very large system, and this has always been a very large system. This was a monsoonal type development out of it, it's very large in nature. Uh, but what that means is, even if you have the storm passing south, you're still going to get significant impacts. Now, here's the H wharf model showing that pretty well. Now, the H wharf. It does take this storm just on the southern end of the islands here. Uh, now, this is possible. We could get a landfall from this, but as I said, we could still get it past south. But note how expansive the wind field is, and it may be a bit larger here than the H wharf depicts. You can see the typhoon force wind field here accompanying this entire island. I'm not completely sure on the island name. I, my geography here is a bit worse since last year when we were watching Hin Hinamnor. Hinamnor? Hinamnor, I think it was, was what it's called last year in September. But you can also see how expansive the tropical storm force wind field is going through pretty much this, in, this entire island chain north of the storm. And of course, in this, you'll get heavy rainfall in the outer bands, strong winds, and even in the outer bands, you can get wind gusts, potentially up to typhoon force, and you'll have all this onshore flow from the system, especially if it's tracking south, which it is likely to do, of all these islands. And you've got all these vulnerable islands to storm surge, and you could get a significant surge. The most significant, of course, will be just north of where the eye tracks. And unfortunately, the surge with a large system like this and very strong winds, it may be very significant. Now, another factor that can will cause it to likely weaken is the system is entering a region of much lower oceanic heat content overall. Now, the system, as it gets larger, will be able to it, it sort of... I, I've talked about this before with prior storms this year. If a storm is so large, it may uh, be able to... Uh, churn up colder water before the eye actually gets to the warm water. And by the time the eye gets there, because of the wind expansive wind field ahead of it, it might churn up that colder water quicker. And we might see weakening from that, or at least maintaining of intensity. Now, the waters here are still fairly warm. They're still about 29 degrees Celsius, and the oceanic heat content is not zero, at least for quite a bit longer in its track. So, whether or not that actually you know, t takes away the uh, the intensification on approach, perhaps if you know the eyewall or present cycle happens to finish quicker than say you might expect, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Now the system is forecast to stall here west of the islands in between uh, Japan and China. And once it does stall, we will likely see significant weakening either way. Uh, these oceanic heat content here is 
much lower. You can see, in fact, there are some values near zero here where the storm is going to be stalling. And if it does stall there, even for a day, it will have a significant upwelling event. And we could be looking at lots of cool sea surface temperatures being upwelled to the surface, and that is most definitely not favorable. It's still likely to become, or at least stay, a typhoon throughout its entire track right now, but it will likely weaken a significant degree, which is good news here. Unfortunately, uh, because of this system staying here so long, and because of its large size, we may have a prolonged typhoon event here in Japan, and even Taiwan and China. Let me make it very clear here as well, that even though over the past couple of days we've seen a significant shift to take a landfall away from China and get a close pass away from Taiwan, you're still likely going to get impacts. And keep in mind, this system could still track a little bit farther south here of this actual forecast cone. We may see this system actually get pretty close in relation to the tropical storm force wind field to these areas. And also there might be some uncertainty uh, well, there is uncertainty on exactly how where the system is going to track in the longer range. There is the possibility that this system perhaps tries to come back west in the longer range towards these land masses, but of course we'll deal with that in due time. Now here's the forecast cone from the Japan Meteorological Agency, and you can see their general forecast cone is similar to the Joint Typhoon Warning Center forecast cone, which was on the Oceanic Key content map, showing the general westward movement. We're fairly confident it will get into this region uh, west of the islands. This is good. This means that the typhoon force winds might stay over water. But again, as I just mentioned, this could track a bit further south, and we could be seeing maybe some tropical storm and typhoon force winds on Taiwan and islands further east. And then we have this recurve towards the northeast, and unfortunately it looks like track will be very slow for movement towards mainland Japan. And now there is also uncertainty on exactly how far east the system gets when it starts tracking northeast. The current forecast cone has this tracking northeast in between China and Japan still, but there are some modeling guidance or guidance envelopes that are still having the system perhaps be a little bit further east. And you can see the uncertainty there in this forecast cone, and that could bring more typhoon conditions to the islands of Japan. Uh, now, if we look at the steering flow past the island, past the potential landfall today and, and tomorrow local time, and we're going to look at the steering flow on the GFS. Now, the pattern still remains fairly the same. We have a ridge to the east, and we have a ridge northwest of the storm. These are making for a fairly light steering flow overall, which means that the system is going to stall here in the South China Sea. I don't think that's the South China Sea. That's just generally east of China, in between the Japanese islands and China. Now, as we go in time, you'll notice that overall, there are no big features really there to pick up the system and carry it out. Now it starts to move very slowly northeast, uh, perhaps because of maybe some increased troughing uh, northwest that I'm seeing on the model. But overall, this motion is very slow. And you can see as we get towards day seven here, the system is still here in the general vicinity of China, Japan, and Taiwan. Now there are some differing solutions here on exactly where the storm tracks at that point. The European is on the idea that the system tracks very close to mainland Japan and tracks east, uh, potentially out to sea. Though we've seen in both the GFS and the European this ridge coming further west to Japan. And you can see on the GFS, this ridge, as it comes west, it begins building further west, which carries the storm after making this northeastward progression. It pushes it down southeast to where eventually the storm starts tracking towards China and Taiwan. Now I'll show you the European solution. The European does not show that ridge building as far west. You can see the general similar pattern to the GFS with a ridge to the northwest and a ridge to the east keeping a fairly weak steering flow in between Japan and China. But as we get towards day seven, we start to see that the system is much further east overall. Uh, and this might be some interaction at play with another area of low pressure that may form in the West Pacific late this week or this weekend. Uh, but you can also see this ridge building in. 
And so eventually the system comes east, but then it gets forced westwards because of this bridge coming in. Now, there is increased troughing on the European over China. So that's why the ridge is not able to build in as much. And in that scenario, you would get a storm likely coming in the mainland Japan, potentially going towards South Korea and then recurving into the uh, Sea of Japan. In the GFS scenario, you would likely get a storm going into China and it would likely dissipate over China. But you can start to get the sense of just how much uncertainty there is right now on exactly where the system is going to track in the longer range. And this is very well depicted on the ensemble plot. This looks like you took a pot of spaghetti that you just boiled on the stove and just slapped it on a map. And this is just amazing to see how much uncertainty there is. And it makes sense given the pattern up north and just how far out this is. We're talking about steering flow that is at and even past seven days. We cannot accurately predict that. But you can just get the semblance here that even with the trends over the past couple of days, those in Taiwan and China, you still need to pay attention to your local weather offices and the Japan Meteorological Agency for the latest information on this. And even remember, again, if the system stays offshore, you're still likely going to get impacts. This system has a very large wind field. You can see that on the Japan Meteorological Agency cone. Here, this yellow line indicates winds, I believe, of gale force. That's a very, very large area. And you can see they're almost to Taiwan already, even though the eye has not even made it to the islands in Japan. It's a very significant situation taking shape. And I know this was a longer video, but there's just a lot to unpack here uh, for everything really with this storm. It's going to be a long and drawn out event, unfortunately. Uh, and I hope everyone stays safe ahead of the storm. That is all for now. I'm not going to be talking about any other systems right now just because of how long this has gone on. And I'll have future videos uh, for the rest of this week, hopefully, as the system passes through and stalls uh, between China and Japan. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching.